So who am I? I've worked on Hadoop for longer than I should admit. Um, but I was the tech lead for MapReduce. I worked on adding security in. Um, more recently, I've been working on Hive and Orc. Um, I've worked on a lot of the different file formats. I've done work on sequence file, RC file, um, Orc file, of course, T file. Does anyone actually know what T file is? Aha, uh -huh. see, it's buried in the Hadoop source code. And it's uh, not very often used, although they just put in a uh, thing for uh, log aggregation that uses it. And so I had one of our engineers come on and look me up because he, I was the only name on the design doc that he recognized and he was trying to ask questions from something that I touched like 10 years previous. That was exciting. And I worked on the Avro requirements back when Doug was getting started with that. So what was the goal for this? I'd previously done a benchmark comparing the different file formats in terms of how Hive used them. But we've been doing a lot of work. Um, actually, one of uh, my coworkers uh, named Dong Jun has done a lot of work speeding up the Spark access for Orc. And so I wanted to take the previous benchmarks and extend them so that they would work with Spark and test it the way that Spark accesses your data. Because that's always been part of Hadoop's central goal and promise is that once you put your data into the system, you can access it the way that makes the most sense for you. And so testing how different people are accessing the, the data can help all the, the um, file formats get better. This really was a science experiment, right? We didn't know what we didn't know. And so we wanted to find out um, not only what performs the best, but also where are they failing, what can do better, and so on. I wanted to use real and diverse data sets. I'd seen some benchmarks before that either use TPCDS, which is a very common data set and uh, very well known, but it's all synthetic data which um, leads to some insane uh, properties of the data that can mess up your benchmarks. Um, and so having real data was important to me. And I wanted the benchmarks to be open sourced and in a public place so that anyone could come in with feedback or suggestions and see exactly what, what it does. Okay, so I wanted to talk about the file formats a little bit. Avro uh, was designed by Doug Cutting. Um, it's a cross-language file format for Hadoop. One of its early, it was the first one to really do schema evolution in a big way. And so that really was one of its defining characteristics. The schema was segregate, segregated from the data, unlike Protobuf or Thrift, which was because it was originally designed as a file format. It really wasn't designed as a messaging or RPC level uh, interface, but even though that's how it's typically used now. And it's a row major format, which means each row is written out together. Avro, by the way, does anyone know what, it, what the name came from? It was the name of an airplane company that uh, Doug's son liked, actually. Of course, the most popular one of his projects, uh, Hadoop, got its name because of that was the name, his son's name for a stuffed elephant. JSON, of course, is incredibly common. Uh, it's a serialization format for HTTP and JavaScript. It's a text format with many, many parsers. Um, the schema is completely integrated with the data. So you basically, if someone gives you a JSON document, you basically have to read the whole thing in order to figure out what types are in there. Um, it's a row major format, each row is written together, and usually compression is put in on top. Orc, or ORC, um, was originally started as part of Hive to replace RC file, and now it's a top level project. Um, the schema is segregated into the footer, so you just have uh, one copy of the schema. It's a column major format so that you can read individual columns without reading the other columns. We'll see why that matters a lot in a little bit. And it's got a rich type, type model and it's stored top down. It's got integrated compression, index, and stats. So part of what our C file did in particular was it treated each of the columns as a blob. That 
made sense originally, but it meant that you couldn't do anything higher level. You couldn't have any understanding of what the data was in the file without a lot of outside information. That turned out to be a serious mistake, and that's a lot of what we were trying to fix. While we were designing or see, um, the guys at Twitter were designing Parquet, and they based it on Google's Dremel paper, which we looked at too. They uh, also segregated the, the schema into the footer to call a major format. They have a much simpler type model where you don't represent the types as precisely. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, you wanted to change the, the mics. Um, and they um, push all the data down to the leaves. Excuse me while we have some technical changes here. Slides. Whoops. <laughs> um, okay, so all the data was pushed to the leaves of the tree. So what that meant was that intermediate columns, if you have structures or lists of structs, in the middle of your data, all that information is pushed to the leaves, which means that you gain some advantages, but it means there's some duplication there. OK, so what data sets did we look at? The first one was the New York taxi data set. Every time someone takes a taxi in New York, New York publishes a data set with a row for each ride. They tell you where they got picked up, where they got dropped off, what time it was, um, and how much they paid uh, in fares and tip. It's a really awesome data set. Um, actually, there's some great data analytics that was done uh, at that URL, and it had some really interesting characteristics. Like, even though the data is totally anonymous, there's nothing in there about people. They, you can tell who some people are because when they get dropped off at a house out in, not in the city, because the city is pretty, uh, has a lot of people overlapping, but when they go out to the suburbs, then you can tell who someone is. Um, and so you can pick out individual writers, and you can see a lot of patterns. So uh, we've pulled 22 million rows out of that. Now, the next one is unfortunately generated data, but it's based on a customer that I've worked with a lot, and I used their real schema. And it's because there really wasn't anything that I could find that was public that matched the same kind of sales data. We used the properties from their real data to generate the, the random data that we used for this. There's a little bit of structures, mostly timestamps, strings, longs, booleans, and we picked arbitrarily 25 million rows to kind of match the other data sets. The third one that's kind of fun is the GitHub blog archives. GitHub makes available to Google and then Google hosts the data where you get one row for every public action on a public repo. So you can see, oh, <laughs> Owen did a commit to um, Orc or Owen did a commit on Hive that day and there'll be a row to show it. Now, this data is insanely complex. Uh, it's got 704 columns uh, with a lot of structures and a lot of nulls. Um, and just a half month of data still gives you 10 million rows. Now, one of the problems with that is the standard one, actually, that comes up a lot in companies. Of GitHub doesn't really provide the schema for that data. So I pulled a few million rows, and I was like, um, <laughs> What types are in here? And so we ended up writing a tool that can go through the JSON and discover the schema, and that's what we used for this. At first, I was going to put the schema on the slide, but then the schema is huge, and so that was not a good plan. <laughs> OK, so which versions of the, the software did I want to test? Uh, I used Spark 231. I used Avro. 182. I tried to use 110, but uh, Spark 23 actually I hit a problem with um, using the, the newer version of Avro. I used Orc 151, Parquet 182. Oh, sorry, other way around. It was Parquet, not Avro. I think, yeah, it was Parquet. Uh, and then Spark Avro uh, 400. Now, it's really easy to say that in the slide. <laughs> 
getting it to actually work and build a single jar with all those things was not fun. Um, I was tempted to call it Maven help, but in reality, Maven just made it possible to do. So it wasn't Maven's fault. It was just the fact that I was trying to combine a bunch of different software that have these huge dependency trees and make them all work together. OK, there were a couple configurations that were really important. The first is that Orc predicate pushdown is turned off by default in Spark, and so you need to turn that to true. And Dong Jun's work actually uh, hasn't been set as the default yet, and so you need to set native equal to true. Otherwise, you'll get the older implementation that goes through Hive uh, input format. Uh, Finally, to get Avro to work, you need to set a config, but not in the Spark config, but in the associated Hadoop config to tell the Avro reader to not ignore files that don't end in Avro. Unfortunately, um, when I tried the... Um, oh, sorry, let me back up. Sorry, the benchmark uses Spark's SQL's file format interface because that provided all the, the functionality we needed. JSON, Orc, and Parquet are all in Spark. I was like, great, this is exactly what I need. Avro didn't have one, but then Databricks, the people who work on Spark, made one available. Awesome. Unfortunately, when you tried to run it, you get the plane crash, and it doesn't support all the Spark types. Basically, Avro doesn't have a timestamp field or a decimal field, and so Hive uses it in 96 in bytes and sets a flag saying, oh, this is actually a timestamp, or this is actually a decimal. And the Avro Spark reader didn't handle it, so it crashed. So ignoring Avro for the rest of it. Oh, no, actually, talk about it a little bit. So first, I wanted to go through and just generate the data. Um, and why does the data size matter? Well, because you're still storing this, right? You've got three copies of each of your data files in Hadoop. And when Facebook moved from HDFS, or moved from RC file to ORC, they saved, I think it was 100 terabytes. And so they were decommissioning a lot of servers because they suddenly didn't need them anymore. Um, the, it's also a big factor in, in the read speed. HDFS read speeds are typically about 15 megabytes a second in a real cluster. The HDFS guys like to cl claim it's 100 megabytes a second, and <laughs> it's not. That only works if you've got a completely empty cluster that's only running your benchmark, which I don't know how many of you have empty clusters. If you do, come talk to me. I can get you some workload to run on them. Um, but that, so 15 megabytes is a much more realistic um, number. Orc and Parquet both use run length encoding in dictionaries. And all the formats have uh, general compression. With general compression, you have a trade-off. There's Zlib, which gives you tighter compression, but is slower, and Snappy, that is some compression is, is faster. OK, so here we've got the different file choices. By the way, if you're ever doing benchmarking and someone talks you into doing a, a matrix, it's a really bad idea, because all it takes is four file formats cross three uh, data sets and then cross three different compression formats to make a really complicated chart and a lot of benchmarking. Uh, so you can see the JSON with no compression was the absolute worst. Uh, Parquet with Zlib did the best, and the other ones are in the middle. Um, so don't use JSON. I had one, someone once tell me, I don't know who this Jason guy is, but clearly he's a bad guy. Um, you should be using either Snappy or Zlib compression. Uh, Avro has a small compression window, which hurts, and Parquet's Zlib is, is the smallest. OK, on sales, on the other hand, we got a very different picture. Jason is still bad. See, bad Jason. Um, don't store your data in Jason. <laughs> And we'll really see that when we get to the, the read speed instead of just the sizes. Um, Orc did the best. Uh, Parquet did the next best. And then Avro is at the back just before Jason. Um, this is actually amusing because the customer that um, 
the scheme was based on uses ORC extensively, and so it's good that it works on their test case, although it's probably a feedback loop where we fix the things that, that uh, don't work well for them. Um, so what happened here, we had a lot of columns with small cardinality, so we got dictionaries, uh, lots of timestamp columns where ORC does well, and doubles. Doubles actually turned out to not encode as tightly with ORC, um, partially because we didn't run length encode them, although we're looking at that for the next version of the format, and also because our performance engineer detuned them so that they don't gzip as hard either. Um, because he realized he could make the whole thing faster if he detuned the, the zlib compression for doubles. And finally, for GitHub, this one we get some interesting results. JSON none is still huge, but look at the best one. That's Avro with JSON. Um, or Avro with zlib and then JSON with zlib is just after it, uh, followed by orc with zlib. So the reason that that happened is basically um, what happens in this file or this data set is that you have so many columns, the column or compression actually doesn't work very well because you've got 900 columns. Each one starts a new zlib stream at the top. And so instead of remembering you've got HTTPS once and saying, oh, I'll just refer to that, which happens in, in JSON and uh, Avro, it instead needs to relearn that over and over again. Um, and so we need to investigate using Z standard with a, dic a preloaded dictionary so that we can get better compression. OK, so what use cases? The first one, we just want to read all of the columns and all the rows. Um, one of the things that people often worry about is whether you can assign different workers to work on different pieces. Fortunately, all the formats are good with that, except for JSON when it's compressed. Um, and um, with Spark, one of the, the characteristics that wasn't obvious until we started hitting it is that when you're reading data through the, the file format interface, Spark will use columnar batch, which is a faster internal representation, if all of your types are primitive types. So of ours, only taxi fits into that category. OK, so first notice that I've put it on a logarithmic scale. So each of those lines means it's twice as fast as the, the one above it. Um, and these are seconds as you did the read. So you can see that. The um, lowest one is Parquet. Parquet is a little faster. Orc is next, and then JSON is really slow, like really painfully slow. Um, it's 256 seconds instead of eight seconds. So really painfully slow. That's why you don't use JSON, bad JSON. Um, JSON's slow, of course, because it, it uh, needs to do a lot of string parsing, and Parquet is the fastest. I suspect, although I haven't verified it yet, that it's because the, even the faster ORC reader, which is, in fact, much faster than the old one, is still going through an extra level of indirection. It's going through the vectorized row batch to the ORC struct and then to columnar batch. We've written some code that gets rid of that, so it'll go straight uh, from the vectorized row batch to the columnar batch, which will make it much, much faster. We just need to get that code committed and then released. Um, now, sales, we got a little bit different picture. Um, so here, ORC did really well, partially because it's smaller and partially because the data is better suited uh, for what ORC is fast at. Uh, Parquet is a little bit slower, and JSON is still the slow poke. Um, so, here, the, the read performance is dominated by the format. It makes the most difference which format you've encoded and less about the, the particular compression picked. OK, now GitHub times. Um, here, actually, JSON had its first and only win. Um, you can see that the fastest was JSON GitHub. Now, granted, it's huge, but it's still fast. Um, Orc is next, and Parquet is, is Worse. Now, when I talked to the uh, Twitter guys, the guys who, who started Parquet, they said, oh, yeah, don't use 
parquet for that case. I was like, really? That's the use case that it was, that was, Dremel was made for. Um, but yeah, they say don't use it like that. Now, one of the other characteristics is that uh, because there are so many columns, the stripes are actually ending up pretty small. And so if you're um, writing your application, you really should configure a bigger stripe size uh, for these very wide files. Uh, you'll do much better. Now, um, we're going to add something in ORC uh, to say, to define a minimum number of, of rows per stripe, because if you have too few rows, then the, the optimizations don't work well. All right, so the next use case uh, is for column projection. Often when you're running your query or writing your program, you only need a few of the columns. So it's not that uncommon to have 100 columns and you just need two or three or five of them. And so this is where the columnar formats actually change. Um, you can actually just read and decompress the bytes you need for those columns and you don't need to read the rest. And Spark file format makes it really easy. You get to pass in your desired schema, and the file format is required to, to process that and uh, figure out which columns it needs and not read the rest. JSON and Avro obviously do the read, the, read first and then just drop the columns, or can parquet. Don't bother reading the data because it's faster. OK, so this is the percentage of the data that uh, ORC and Parquet read in the different cases um, for the different use sets. So I sorted by which use case and then uh, the format and then the compression. So you can see for GitHub, ORC was reading about 4% typically, and Parquet was a little bit higher, but about the same. This is still logarithmic scale, so it's doubling. Oh no, this is the one that's not logarithmic. This is just the percentage. Uh, for sales, it was somewhere between 3% and 4%. Uh, Parquet was a little bit bigger, up at 8%. And then uh, for the taxi data set, Parquet went crazy and somehow read 20% of the data and for the two columns that I asked for in the benchmark. And so I'm not quite sure what's up with that, but it's repeatable. So you can see that, obviously, if something was 100%, then you don't have column projection. So if you put Avro or JSON on here, it'd clearly be at 100 for all of these. Um, so all of them are much, much better, and the times come down correspondingly. Now, predicate pushdown. Predicate pushdown is a nice characteristic of the more advanced readers. Um, when you're querying, for example, when you just want the uh, names for employees that were hired between a given set of dates, you express your SQL query like that. The reader gets passed down, oh, I want a hire date between those two dates, and given, it's given to the file format during via filters. And um, this is uh, primarily useful on sorted columns. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So ORC and Parquet index their rows uh, with min and max values for a whole set of ranges. So sorted data means that it can use those min and maxes to say, OK, I don't need to read those rows. I won't bother parsing it at all. Um, the now, if you don't have sorted data, for example, I've got one customer that has, um, wants to do queries on customer names. Customer names can't really be the sort key because they need to sort by time. And so they need to query on customer names all the time, but it, it can't be the sort key. So for them, we made bloom filters. And so when you set up a bloom filter, it records a probabilistic answer to whether specific values are in this uh, set of rows. And so they do take more space, but they let you uh, answer the question of, OK, do I need to look at this set of rows at all? Uh, and only ORC has that. The 
readers uh, for a predicate pushdown can either filter out the entire file, the stripe, the section of the file that you work on, or uh, in ORC, you can also get row groups down to 10,000 rows. Now, after this, after you get the results back, you still need to uh, have the engine check the filter at the row by row level. This will just say, yes, you need to read these 10,000 rows, but there may be stuff in there that you don't want. So you still need to check it. All right. <clears throat> now, when we did this, um, obviously, we only did it with ORC and Parquet. The dark line is the total number of records. The blue line is how many records Parquet read, and the green one is how many ORC read. And notice those lines are uh, logarithmic again. So in this case, you've got 10,000 for the taxi data that ORC read versus the uh, 22 million that, that Parquet read. Now what's going on here is that the Parquet reader decided it didn't know how to deal with timestamps. So in terms of the predicate pushdown. And so it silently said, OK, I'm, j I'm just going to read everything. And, and did. Actually, that's also what happened on the GitHub side, is it read all the records. Um, now, sales, it had an integer, so the predicate pushdown actually worked. But because ORC has the indexes at the 10,000 row level, it was able to read just 10,000 rows. Uh, Parquet ended up reading 60 times that, which is the size of its stripe. And of course, uh, that, that's still 100 times better than the, the total number of rows. So you can see why this predicate pushdown is a big deal. A few years ago, when Yahoo was um, still in existence, instead of being Oath now, they um, were benchmarking Hive against Spark, and they uh, were running their queries. And there was one query that was coming back really fast on Hive. They thought it was broken. But it turned out that part of what was going on was it was exactly doing this predicate pushdown. And so the um, Hive running out of HDFS just uh, needed one file and one section of one file. So it was reading basically 10,000 rows. And then it had its answer. Uh, Spark, even once it was in memory, had 100 terabytes in memory. So it took a lot of ex executors looking through all of its memory to figure out, oh, OK, here's the one row I need. So, um, so Hive was much, much faster than Spark, even once Spark had everything cached in memory. Of course, now with LAP, LAP is the new execution engine for um, Hive that caches data aggressively, and so it would be much, much faster. Actually, we've had queries run against LAP where you're testing against a table with six billion rows to come back in less than a second. It's really amazing, actually. OK, so as I said, Parquet doesn't push down uh, timestamp filters. Um, Spark. Default ORC to predicate pushdown off, you need to turn that on. Um, the small ORC stripes for GitHub meant that we ended up with a small read of less than um, 10,000 rows. And because it's an optimization, the file formats aren't very good about telling you when it's been turned off. Um, that's something we should actually get better at. It took actually looking at the data of how much data had been read before I was sure, <laughs> OK, the predicate pushdown actually happened. And then you start looking for cases about why it didn't happen. Um, the benchmark actually uses a, a tracking file system so that it can see how many bytes got read or written. OK, another advantage of ORC and Parquet is that they store some additional metadata in the file footer. So they have the file schema, but they also have the number of records and the min, max, and count of each column. And so if you need any of that, it's actually pretty easy to get it in O of 1 access. OK, some conclusions. One of the most important things here is everything changes, right? Open source systems are continually evolving, right? The environments change, and so things are constantly changing, right? If you did a similar benchmark 
a couple of releases ago for Spark, it would have been a very different experience. And so you actually need to take that into account. Um, the benchmarks will change, but only when people come up with suggestions for what to, to do better. The other thing is to really evaluate your needs. Most people really need column projection, and predicate pushdown is a nice to have. But you definitely want to be in either ORC or Parquet most of the time. You want to determine how to sort your data. We had some customers that were trying to partition their data by both country and their product. And that made it easy to query. You could filter out things. But it really meant that you ended up with some little teeny partitions, right? If you look at how many people in Guatemala want to use product X, that's a really small number compared to like the number in Germany, for example, that uh, would be much larger. For them, it's much better to sort the data and then let predicate push down to work the data. Um, and then considering bloom filters is another really good case. If you have equality, bloom filters don't work for less than or greater than. They only work for strict equality. So, but if you have a lot of equality tests where you're looking for point lookups, they're really useful. OK, questions? Let's thank the speaker first. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, come on. Someone have a question. Oh, there's one. There's one here. <laughs> when you read the data in Spark, mm -hmm. you actually need to do an action in order to something happen. So, so how do you separate the action time from the, the actual read time? So that's part of why I was using the, the file format, or rather the benchmarks were using the file format uh, interface so that it doesn't launch tasks to, to read it. So it wasn't just the declaring the task, it was actually accessing the file format directly. Basically, the point was to make micro benchmarks that would exactly isolate out the reading from the, the processing that would happen downstream. There's one right there. Two more. We've got plenty of time. <laughs> Uh, you said that you don't really know that uh, Parquet is going crazy on this <laughs> Git data, right? But do you have any explanation what is different in the data set? What so, is a recommendation when to not use Parquet? Okay, so, okay, technically <laughs> what I said Parquet was going crazy was just the predicate pushdown, and that wasn't on the GitHub data, that was on the, the sales data, I think, wasn't it? Actually, that was the column projection one, right? Let me back up. Uh, now, the... Okay, there should be a faster way to do this. Sorry. Yeah, that was actually the taxi data, where the, the column projection on the taxi data. Now, the, the Twitter guys... And actually, the results here also pointed out that for highly complex data, for the GitHub case, you don't want to use Parquet. And uh, when I looked at it, it mostly seems to be about out, uh, memory allocation. It's basically creating a lot of temporary objects and then throwing them away. So it's creating GC thrash. Well, there was a question here. Is that gone? So I guess based on your presentation, actually, when I have a specific use case, it will be really hard to look in the internet, the advantages, disadvantages of each of the formats. The better way is just to take a sample of data set and to use a benchmark. Do you have any recommendations, tips? What, so, uh, how, what's the size of the data? How to do proper benchmark? Um, OK. Well, first of all, I haven't pushed this code up yet, but I will shortly. Um, the, Earlier benchmarking code is already in the ORC project, so you can actually download the, the GitHub, uh, and it uh, lets you down. It has a script to download the data that you need, or you can put your own data in and then process it. You just need to, to fill in the benchmarking code. The benchmarking code uses JMH, which is Java Micro Benchmark Harness, which is integrated into OpenJDK and does a really nice job of both uh, letting you specify variants and um, 
measure the execution time and the other attributes you're interested in. So absolutely, download the benchmarks, put your real data in. Obviously, for open talks and for uh, the public benchmarks, I can only use data that's publicly available. <laughs> Right, obviously, the, the customer that gave me the, the schema for the, the um, sales table wouldn't even let me use the real column names. <laughs> I basically had to completely change the column names because they were that worried about anything leaking out about what they're doing. But um, yeah, no, it'd be relatively straightforward to plug it in and, and use your real data, so absolutely. So hi. Um Thank you. I would be interested. You talked about customers a lot, um, about the amount of adoption of Columnar formats like ORC or Sna um, Parquet, mm -hmm. because I got the feeling that with the traction of the Kafka Avro uh, marriage, I would say, that a lot of people just dump their Avro records into HDFS, <laughs> HDFS again. And maybe you have a view from the market. What's, how often do you see people really using something like ORC or Parquet? Actually, mostly we do because they, they stream through it. Um, often they use Avro, like you said, to, to put it through Kafka. But then once they land in HDFS, then they want to put it into a columnar format because the performance advantages are really, really high. And you write it into HDFS once, and then you read it a lot. And so usually most customers find that, yeah, it streams through their Kafka as, as Avro, but then once it lands in HDFS, they, they translate it over. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've got one more question in the back. Can you raise your hand again? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask about the uh, ORC version mm -hmm. two. Um, is there a <laughs> timeline for finalizing it? Or what, what can we expect from it? Um, so, trying to be realistic, it'll probably be out later this year. Um, we have, it's still relatively early in the design. At this point, we're uh, figuring out um, what needs to be there and what we want to change in the format. So effectively, ORC had uh, two format, two versions of the format. The first one that was in the very first release of Hive that ORC was in, which was Hive 011. Then in the very next release, 012, <coughs> we came out with what we now call version one. And version two is has been in the, the works, we know a couple pieces that we absolutely need to fix. We need to make timestamps better. <laughs> we screwed up the, the time zones. Oh my god, the person who decided to ever put any time zone information in was, was a really bad plan. <laughs> but um, I wish we could just use like standard UTC all the time, but at least for programming that would make life much, much better. Um, but yeah, I'd say by the end of the year, we should have um, it at least out in alpha. Thank you. Uh, let's take one more last question. <laughs> um, so for uh, data with a <clears throat> complex uh, schema, like mm -hmm. for instance, GitHub, in a machine learning application where um, most of the columns would be used anyway for feature extraction, uh, do you still see an advantage to use uh, columnar formats like Parquet or ORC? If you're really just going to use it all the time and it's highly um, structured, Avro does work pretty well. Um, so uh, with with the with the stuff. restriction that that for Spark, the Avro adapter I'm not very happy with. <laughs> I'm about ready to file a bug report on the Avro descriptor saying what the hell. <laughs> but um, that but that aside, Avro does work very well for the the highly structured case um, where you don't need to do column projection. Okay, but the columnar ones are still better than JSON even in this case, right? Yes. <laughs> Basically, JSON is always really slow. 
is really what it boils down to. And if you've ever tried to actually look through the details of a JSON parser, you'd understand why. All right. Uh, let's thank you very much. Thank the speaker again.